everybody, welcome back to another episode of Lewd Low Effort Woodwind Doubling. This is Albano the Madman speaking, and we're going to be talking Sopranos today. It is the third highest pitched voice in the saxophone family. Everybody who's kind of, kind of looking for a, a uh, new voice, you know, this, is, this whole series is mainly for people who are looking to double on horns and, uh, you know, don't want to sort through like 800 videos on specific topics. This is trying to, trying to mash everything all together in a very low effort format. So, you want to play soprano, be, it, be you a clarinet player who, you know, listened to a bunch of Sidney Bechet, you know, and uh, one said, hey, that sounds pretty neat, or you heard some Coltrane albums like I did when I was a kid. Actually, a little funny aside, what the thing that made me want to get a saxophone in the first place was actually pretty silly. I was very young. It was probably like 10, 11 years old. I was watching TV and there was a commercial that came on for the local smooth jazz radio station. This is not BS. This is absolutely true. And there was a guy playing a saxophone on it. It was, uh, it was a guy holding a soprano sax like this, but uh, there was like alto or something lower pitch coming out. I don't remember and I didn't know at the time. So, uh, but I was just sitting there watching it. It was like, wow, that's something that I want to do for the rest of my life. Cut to 30 years later and look at how well that turned out. Jazz! Let's get you started. So, we got two flavors of soprano. We have a third, but I don't own one, so we're gonna pretend it doesn't exist. We have our typical, the typical soprano you're gonna see, and the uh, one that you're most likely to get your hands on, your peanut butter, your grubby peanut butter internet hands. Um, you're gonna be looking at a soprano that looks like this, straight. They're pitching the key of B flat an octave above a tenor. It is the third highest pitch voice in the saxophone family. You have a soprillo, you have a, hang on, Sopranino. I, I was practicing it earlier, so I just had it on the on the shelf here. And uh, yeah, and the soprillo, which I don't have because why? And it's an octave higher than a soprano sax. Why would you, why? Why would you need that? I don't know. It's fun. It's probably really fun to have, but uh, not, uh, not, not for me, and definitely not for my wallet. But okay, so we're gonna concentrate mainly on this guy. But what you heard at the beginning was just a little, a little introduction contrasting both of them. They both sound a little different, not by much, but you know, it's mainly a look and a, and a comfort, and maybe, maybe. Uh, Maybe you like the sound of a curved one because the lower notes kind of get redirected back at you. Um, I prefer the uh, I prefer the straight one myself, but uh, you know, to each their own. There's uh, another funny thing: these horns are over a hundred years apart. So this is a con, a con curved soprano from 19, I believe, if I'm remembering the serial number chart, 1915, and this one was made sometime in the. Uh, mid 2010s and uh, so this is a Rampone Kazani these were these are amazing horns they're handmade built in Italy and uh, just solid 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 horn and this is also super solid but this is uh, this is uh, yeah this is kind of a, a little gem of mine this little curved I bought it because I was uh, working on cruise ships and I wanted this one uh, to pack it up and travel with is a lot more difficult than the tiny case that this thing has. So also bear that in mind, very easy to fit this in the overhead compartment. This one, believe it or not, even with a, uh, you see those uh, Protec cases there, it, it's just because it's a long case and it's weird to fit, fit up in the uh, overhead compartment. But okay, so. We're, we're picked up this horn for the first time. Uh, what are the few things we need to know? Well, let's talk mouthpieces first. Um, honestly, we have a couple of, or I did. Well, anyway, we have a, a decent mouthpiece to start on. I'm not playing the one I'm gonna be talking about, but I'm playing the one, I'll tell you about the one I was playing for many years, was a uh, Selmer F and S80F, and it's a good classical mouthpiece, but it's a little wider tip opening than I think some of our classical friends might want to play. Um, as a jazz musician, I typically like kind of a medium to medium open tip, 
and a, and a medium read. But, uh, you know, that's a great piece to start on. It, when it's Soprano, you really want something decent. You don't need to spend a huge amount of money, but you can find a used Selmer S80 online for probably a hundred bucks, maybe a tiny bit more. But, you know, that's something is to look for hard rubber to start, only to start, just so you can get your bearings on the instrument. And the uh, C Stars are great because they, they play very evenly. You can get great results with your intonation. And, uh, you know, it's very easy to play, provided you set it up with the proper strength. Really, it's very easy to get through the whole range of the horn. But it is kind of a, I don't want to say a neutral sound, but it's definitely leaning more towards that kind of classical timbre. So if that's what you like, then go uh, by all means. You can your search is over. You know me. I wanted something a little a little different. I actually opted for this mouthpiece I'm playing right now. I'll play a little bit more. Is a uh, a Luna made by Arnold Montgomery, and uh, these are particularly great because the next point. Vintage horns, especially these old American horns, are a larger bore than a lot of the Sopranos you're going to find. Intonation is very difficult to control, and like I said, I don't know the whole specifics behind the thing, but that's not the point of these videos. If you're looking at a early American horn, what you may want to look into is a large chambered mouthpiece. Now these, by Arnold Montgomery, are great. They're large chambered, they have a slight rollover baffle. And uh, he makes them in metal and hard rubber, and man, these are fantastic. So uh, you can go check them out. I'll leave a, leave a link in the description if you want to see what he's got. But uh, this is an older model of his. He doesn't make these anymore. He makes the Luna, but he doesn't make this particular style Luna. But his, I played some of his newer mouthpieces a few years back in Nam, and they are fantastic. I mean, he does excellent work. But uh, with Soprano... Until you really get your bearings, you want something that's going to, you want equipment that's going to kind of, it's not going to hinder you. If I slap that Selmer on my con, it's going to hinder me because it's too resistant to be efficient with playing. You get tired when something's a little too resistant. And the tip, open, tip openings are about the same. That's a Selmer F that I have, and this is a, a 8 in 8 Luna. So maybe the Selmer is a little smaller tip opening, but the chamber's small, it chambers a little smaller, and it plays a lot more resistance. So they're equally, they're, uh, the Selmer is actually a little harder for me to play. But this one's worked out pretty good. But, you know, start, start with a Selmer, or start with, uh, Myers are okay to start. You can, uh, and, and we're not looking at expense right now. We're just looking, we, we got the instrument and we just want to kind of set it up with something decent. Uh, Van Dorm Reeds on Soprano, I've used them for decades and decades. They're fantastic. Uh, purple box, or blue box, or however you want to call them. The uh, original flavor, if you will, uh, have been fantastic. And I set these up with uh, two and a halfs. And I can get through the whole range of the horn and I get a big sound and a decent subtone. And that's kind of all I'm looking for in a piece. Basically, once I find something that works, I just stay with it. And this has worked out fantastic. A little bright, a little brighter than the Selmer. And the Selmer tone is a little more centered. This is a little more spread. So, you know, as far as intonation goes, we gotta work on controlling. But projection, projection, no problem. This doesn't really have that much of a baffle to it. So, uh, it's not always about the baffle. It's about how you're playing and how you're voicing. Talk horns for a minute. A lot of earlier examples of soprano, they're keyed, you find some later examples that are keyed to uh, high F, but this is an early example keyed to high F, but after these, you find mostly, especially in the early, early 20th century, like uh, 1920s maybe, you'll find a lot of them keyed to E flat, or E, some of them have the, uh, the E key here. But, uh, you know, a lot of them you'll find are key to, a lot of the ones you'll find from uh, eh, probably the 30s onward until like maybe the, uh, maybe the 80s maybe, once Selmer introduced the uh, super action, uh, you'll find that they're key to high F, but they lack a front F. And I'm not sure why that decision was made, because every other horn, the front F was, uh, or fork F if you want to call it that, 
was part of uh, just generally a part of every saxophone. It was just, hey, this is great for technique, and we can play out. It makes it easier to start playing altissimo stuff, you know, Sergei Rasher and whatnot. So let's just slap that on every horn, except soprano. And it's really a shame that they they didn't do it because some of those horns play fantastic. But if you want to update it, like let's say I wanted to put a front F on this guy, that'd be a lot of money, you know. It's not only the key, I believe All Egg sells a, All Egg Products sells a, uh, a fork F assembly for soprano saxophones for cons as well as Selmers and Yannick style, Yannick Asawa style horns, which the earlier examples were copies of a Mark VI anyway, so. But it's not just buying the part, it's, it's, it's having it soldered on, it's an expense, you know, and, uh, Depending on the horn, it may not be worth the money to do. And especially if you don't feel the need to go beyond F. And some of the uh, later horns also, while they didn't have a front F, they were keyed. They had a uh, high F sharp key. So, I mean, if you didn't feel the need to go beyond that, aside from a few a few weird technical passages, it really doesn't make a whole lot of difference. So you should be really practicing with your palm keys anyway. I know the front F is really nice to have, but it's not for every single passage you're ever going to play. But, yeah. But, more often than not, you're going to see horns in this style. Okay, we're jumping. We're jumping. You're going to see straight soprano saxophones, and they're made by... There there's so many different manufacturers. Like I said, this is uh, Rampon Kazani. That's a con sitting on the uh, table. The Sopranino you saw was uh, made by Jim Bao. You could watch that video here. There. Or anywhere. So, we're, we got the thing in our hand. We talked about mouthpieces. So, you went out. You found an S80. Probably bought. I would start. I would start at a. Uh, go to the store. Try a D. Try a D. Like, a D's a good starting place. It's a decent middle of the road thing. Um, a D would probably pair well, very well with three and a half after you get used to playing. Because it'll really help you get up into the, uh, into the high registers. But three and a half or four even could be nice. But now that we have our mouthpiece, we have our mouthpiece. And Meyer to try, like, stick with a medium opening for the moment, you know, just so you get used to playing the horn. You can find plenty of mouthpieces. Oh, the Van Dorns are really nice, too. The, uh, uh what are they? The, <clears throat> whatever the new model Van Dorn is. I had one, I had one a long time ago. I don't have it anymore, unfortunately. But their mouthpieces are also really nice. Um, stick with, like, an S, S6 or S7, you know, it's not too wide of a tip. You're not going to tire out your embouchure, you know, you can really work on how you're voicing the note and your airstream and things like that, you know. We're going to go through specifics of saxophone stuff and technique and everything when we do the alto tenor video, which is coming up actually next. You know, as far as your playing position, you know, you don't want to think of any normal saxophone, the angle the saxophone will go into your neck, and it's pretty much the same thing for me when I play. About that, I do... Uh, for armature, I don't keep a classical armature. I kind of roll my lip out a little bit. I was watching a Dave Liebman video, and he's kind of talking about it. And he doesn't do, like, full lip out. But it is partial. He has a little more lip. It increases the surface area of the reed that vibrates, you know. And you get a bigger sound. So, uh, yeah, you know, I'll never be playing classical music <laughs> convincingly. But, you know, for for a jazz-style thing, that lip out armature, it's pretty good. Yeah, you try it. But... You'll find as you, when you start, you know, work on your long tones. So like, like any other horn, especially with this guy's for intonation, work on your long tones because uh, you'll find that if you try that lip out armature, you'll get tired a lot quicker, you know, and it takes, uh, it takes a while to build up that strength again. But that happens anytime you change your armature. So, you know, just something to bear in mind. But here, you know, bust out your tuner. And just start and start playing your long tones. Just... Do the octaves. Still warming up myself. But, you know, practice it. Practice the chromatical, chromatic scale in octaves is always great. Do it way slower than what I just did. You know, hold the beat, hold the note for eight counts or something, you know. And you don't... The thing with soprano, and it's, it's kind of a sticking point with me. You know, I used to teach... I don't teach anymore, but I used to te teach kids. And a lot of people do not want children starting on soprano. 
And honestly, I don't really see how much different this horn would be from playing an alto, let's say, or a clarinet. Clarinet, we have students that are playing all the way up to their high C, which is the same as this high C, by the way, or B flat concert. You know, they had, they're playing up to there within their first, first, maybe year, year and a half. And, you know, it's about long tones and practice and having a proper, proper setup. You know, for a kid, you can get away with like a Yamaha piece and a relatively soft read, and you can still do pretty well. They can play along with the trumpets. You know, I could have uh, kid trumpet players in band playing like triple high C's and stuff. So, you know, having her double along with the uh, clarinets, like the Lee clarinet, or with some of the trumpet stuff is, is totally fine. I remember, um, just as an aside, I had a story where the, a little kid came into the shop we were working, working at. They wanted to uh, they wanted to play saxophone. They didn't want to play clarinet. The uh, the teacher recommended, the music instructor at the school recommended she start on clarinet. And she's like, I want to play saxophone, you know, little little kid, you know. So we're like, well, okay. So I actually got to put, kind of put this theory to the test. So we got her a soprano, got her one like this. Although for a little kid, maybe a curved would be uh, would be easier for them to start with. That concession I will make. You know, maybe start them on a curved soprano. There's plenty of cheap and pretty decent ones you can find on eBay. But uh, you know, and so she got she got her horn. And I was like, you know, I showed her how to play the first three notes, a little hot cross bun thing, and she tutored it out fine. So I was like, okay, try try this note. But one, two, boom, 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 and a little bit of fiddling, fiddling with her hands to get them in the proper thing, and she popped out that D like no problem. Now, is that going to be for every kid? Probably not, but she she was playing it. Like, she had the capacity, and this was, she was probably like eight, nine years old, maybe. But she had the capacity to play this instrument. You know, like I said, maybe for size, the curve might be a little more manageable for small hands, but um, she was doing it. And cut to like a few weeks later, I hear that the music teacher kind of nixed it. And, uh, you know, wanted the kid to play, wanted the kid to play clarinet, and I don't know what happened after that. You know, hopefully uh, the parents didn't listen and got her the, uh, got her the soprano anyway, because I saw, I saw the kid's eyes light up when they got it, and, uh, you know, that's, that's my little, my little sad story. But anyway, you know, practice your long tones. It's just like any, any, any other instrument you're going to have. Practice your long tones. Definitely get, uh... Get yourself a copy. Get the Joe Viola books, man. I'll put I'll put a uh, well. I don't do the Amazon uh, Amazon associate thing, but you know, find a copy of the Joe Viola, the Scale book, the Chord Studies book, and the Rhythm Studies book. They're great. They're great for sight reading and getting your getting your chops together on the instrument. Even uh, I mentioned this, and I'm gonna talk more about this in the actual alto tenor video. But uh, Rubang books are fantastic. I know it seems like baby stuff, especially if you've been playing for a very long time. But uh, check out the Rubang books. Excellent, excellent. Start. You can start at the intermediate, and you know if you're just playing a sax for the first time, especially if you're going from flute or clarinet to saxophone and those both have different challenges which we'll get to in the next video you know it'll it'll be uh it's good to humble hum humble yourself a little bit and sight read some baby stuff you know here and there just to, to, to get your bearings so okay i mean that's that's basically how you set this guy up what style horn you end up going with is completely up to you there's really not there's not any argument for one over the other. Some guy, some people like how this horn redirects the sound back into their head, and other people like how like the sound of the straight. I kind of like the straight because it directs everything out in front. It really blasts, blasts those people, you know. Really blasts the audience. But uh, as far as your upper register, just don't forget as you go higher. You know, your throat, your throat, this whole, this whole, you have to speed the air up as you go higher in the horn. So the air has to speed up. The throat closes just a little tiny bit. The tongue is arched in the roof of your mouth a little bit like you're saying E, you know, instead of ooh, it's E. You know, speed that air up. Best to practice your...
Practice your, uh, practice your harmonics, which I was in the middle of doing before. I was like, I really need to get this done, you know, at least uh, as far as you know. Or maybe I was playing video games. But practice your harmonics, practice your long tones, and you'll be able to get a, uh, a pretty decent hold. As far as technical aspects of the instrument, that's for next video. But uh, this is just a little bit of a primer for the soprano. It's really, uh, really it. This is low effort woodwind doubly, where we just jam everything into the same video. But, uh... <laughs> That's it. Little, little tiny introduction to the soprano sax. Music? What music do you want to play? Just it fits into any style, and we're not talking repertoire. Right? We don't talk about repertoire on this channel, because I'm a jazz musician, and you know, anything can be our repertoire. If you're just a musician, you want to pick it up. You know, there's uh, very little things. Except we will go over one quick thing before I end the video. The technique. For, we won't talk about altissimo, fing altissimo fingers, but I will talk about one thing. A lot of these saxophones, especially the new ones, have a layout here. They go up to high G. So there's actually a high G key just in case, you know, you didn't think F sharp. F sharp was too low. G sharp was too high. And G's just right. So these keys here, as you're playing, for me, I like to play with the... Uh, the third, the ring finger, finger three. It, it For me, it might not be proper technique, but for me it works. And so for the F sharp key, I play with the uh, finger number three, and the uh, G key, I play with number two. And always you can play them from the uh, fork F, or you can play them from the uh, palm keys. And really, you know, that's just one extra technical consideration to play, because a lot of sopranos you're gonna see will have that F sharp and G key, especially very modern ones, the uh, earlier examples won't. So that's not gonna be a concern for you, you know. But uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. So this is the world of soprano. This is actually, for the longest time, is what I consider to be my main instrument. And I still love playing it, but now I'm kind of more of an all-around guy. So, you know, I just, my main instrument is me, and I just have the horns to express that bit of my humanity. Not to get too deep, but uh, anyway. So that's it for this video. Like, comment, and subscribe. I get tongue tied too often. Like, comment, and subscribe. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. Love y'all.